Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar, Social Science in the Age of Trump, What We'd Like to See with Wendy Naus. My name is Michael Todd, and I'm the editor of the Social Science Space website. I'd like to begin by introducing our guest before we start our conversation. Wendy, Naus is, Wendy A. Naus is the Executive Director of the Consortium of Social Science Associations, or COSA, a nonpartisan umbrella organization that works to protect and promote social and behavioral science in the United States. She became the fourth executive director of COSA in 2014 after a decade of lobbying for the federal research and policy interests of scientific societies and U.S. universities. Over her career, she's worked to shape legislation, programs, and regulations important to the research community and has advocated for increased funding uh, for research across federal agencies. Uh, Wendy serves as the lead advocate for federal funding and policy that at COSA, Wendy serves as the lead advocate for federal funding and policy that positively impacts social and behavioral science research, and which and representing the breadth of social science research enterprise. She is also responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of COSA and member or engagement. Now, this one-hour webinar will record it and archive for future viewing, and we'll be sending out a link to view it and to access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. A couple of uh, technical things. If you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. At the end of the webinar, we will, or at the end of the prepared portion of the webinar, we'll have some time for Q&A from attendees. So please also use that Q&A box to ask any questions to our speaker throughout the webinar. We'll make that request again after Wendy's prepared remarks are done, but you can send those questions at any point that the news strikes you. And please also take note of the webinar hashtag, Social Science Live, and feel free to ask questions or leave comments there. Now, let's start the conversation with Wendy. Want to take it? Great. Thank you, Michael. Okay, hopefully you can see my slides now. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining for this important discussion. As Michael said, I'm Wendy Noss, and I'm Executive Director of the Consortium of Social Science Associations in Washington, D.C. And it's my pleasure to be with you today to answer your questions and to discuss the prospects I see for social science research in this new political environment. For those who are unfamiliar with COSA, really quickly, we're an advocacy organization first and foremost, and we focus entirely on ensuring a robust social science uh, research enterprise. And we work to protect federal funding for our disciplines and seek to promote our sciences to policymakers throughout the uh, government and encourage their use in evidence-based policymaking. And while we're here today to talk about ways to navigate the current political situation, it's important to note that COSA has been doing this work for more than 35 years. We're, we're, um, we were formed in the early Reagan years when many federal programs were being cut, not dissimilar to where we are today. Um, and so this means that we have more than three decades of experience in defending our science during tough times, but also promoting our disciplines when times are good. Through our efforts, we work to reach four different audiences. Congress is our primary audience, the House and the Senate, because that's where budgets are set and where bills are passed that directly impact our science. But we also engage with the executive branch agencies and with the White House, because those are the entities that are responsible for implementing the laws that Congress writes and managing the funding that Congress appropriates. Another focus for our efforts, though, is engaging with other scientific disciplines outside of the social sciences um, to ensure that they appreciate the contributions that our sciences make. Um, and further, in challenging times, such as the present, it's critical that all of the sciences are working together and not splintering. And that is what's happening right now, the working together. Finally, and more recently, we've been taking steps to inform the public about the value of our sciences. I'll talk more in a little bit about what we're doing in that regard. And just a quick word about our membership. Um, on the slide, you can see the logos of our 17 governing member associations. These are the big disciplinary societies um, that you think of as representing the major social science fields and subfields. 
and our governing members sit on our board of directors and drive the policy of the organization. We also have about 100 affiliate members shown here. Um, I mention these because if you happen to be a member of any of these associations or work at any of our 50 plus universities, you are in fact a COSA member and entitled to receive our materials. So I would invite you to check out our website for more information um, on how to get on our list or to send me an email which I will put on the screen a little bit later. But we're not here today for a commercial about COSA, I understand. Um, and what I really do want to talk about is the current political environment and what it might mean for our sciences and, more importantly, what we can all collectively do about it. So at COSA, we take a multi-pronged approach to our efforts, recognizing that we can't do it alone. Um, and so this includes direct lobbying, which is essentially myself and my team lobbying Congress directly on a near daily basis. It includes member engagement, so making sure that the folks who were listed uh, on the previous slide have the tools that they need to be engaged in advocacy. And then public engagement, which is part of why I'm speaking with you all today. So why is such a multi-pronged or multifaceted approach needed? Well, it's because attacks on social and behavioral science research in particular comes in a variety of forms and different tactics uh, respond, uh, work best for responding to different attacks. So it's important to note that attacks on social science are not new. Um, they're not usually very unique, meaning the same tactics are used over and over again. Um, and we, uh, COSA and the broader uh, scientific advocacy community, have been responding to them and guarding against them, as I said, for more than 35 years. Of course, this is not to suggest that the challenges before us are not serious, um, but because we've been dealing with this for so long, in general, we know how to respond when we see attacks through targeted funding cuts or proposed policy changes, or even if they're just negative remarks by a policymaker that are seeking to undermine the validity of social science. What's different now, though, um, is that the typical policymaking playbook has essentially been thrown out the window. The most troubling thing about where we currently find ourselves as advocates is that all of the, uh, there, there are more unknowns about what the Trump administration is going to do than what is known, and the unpredictability of it all. Obviously, administrations and Congresses come and go, um, and with them do come some big policy changes, whether it's health care reform or increased military presence abroad. But historically, we have had establishment-type leaders who were largely predictable. We knew what they stood for, and we sort of knew what their playbook was for achieving what it was that they were uh, campaigning on. Not since the Reagan years have we seen such an outsider in charge. And for a town like Washington, where the currency is being able to predict what will happen and influencing an outcome, the unpredictability of the Trump administration creates uh, a significant level of chaos and panic, as you could imagine. Now, all that said, I'm not here to scare everyone into submission, but I am suggesting that we as a community need to walk a very delicate line between advocating for ourselves without unintentionally making our sciences a target. Um, and I say this because as of right now, at least um, science, including social science, has not yet been an issue raised by President Trump as a problem in need of fixing. Of course, there are certain areas of research, like climate change and others, for which this is a very different story. Um, but in general, science has not been a topic for debate. Further, uh, the, uh, pre while President Trump has said very little about science throughout his campaign, um, he has been quoted acknowledging that scientific research requires long-term investment. Of course, what we don't know is if he means long-term federal investment or if he believes, like some of his advisors, that science can be left to the private sector. But again, um, I'm not trying to minimize the threats that are likely out there, but just to urge us all to be careful not to antagonize the administration um, when we're not currently on the chopping block as far as we can tell. 
that doesn't mean we shouldn't get organized um, and ready to act for when things start going south. And that's exactly what we're trying to do behind the scenes with our multifaceted approach. Now, of course, um, we are less than a month into the Trump presidency, and already there are some troubling signs of what's to come, uh, including the freeze on hiring federal workers and the overall goal of shrinking the federal workforce, efforts toward regulatory reform, gag orders that you've been hearing about on federal agencies and the sharing of their scientific information, the immigration ban, um, and then the canceling of all of these executive orders from President Obama's tenure. These actions, again, are not aimed directly at the scientific enterprise, but as we're all experiencing, um, they do still have very serious implications for our community. So, um, given the chaos that we're all feeling, where are the silver linings and where are the entry points for folks like us and you um, to be involved? <coughs> So first, we must not forget that there are still clear career civil servants in federal agencies who are trying to make the best of a challenging situation. In addition, <clears throat> Congress is still there and will likely uh, be where all of our focus or a good chunk of our focus and our attention will need to be in the years ahead. I think it's easy to get distracted by the President's actions um, and to think that we need to combat his actions head on. Um, and that's true in some respects, sure, but Congress is where we're going to see things really play out. Things like annual funding for science agencies uh, and other programs, and other bills that impact research in the U.S. In, in one way or another. So therefore, I'm encouraging our members, and you all as well, um, to take your argu arguments to Congress where I think we can have um, the most productive conversations. So as the title of this webinar states, um, what would we like to see our policymakers do? Well, COSA developed a report that was sent to the Trump transition team late last year outlining steps that the administration and Congress can both take to keep the U.S. science enterprise as the best in the world. Our document includes 10 recommendations on funding key appointments in the federal agencies and the White House and uh, steps that could be taken to preserve and enhance federally curated and collected data and statistics. And the report can be found on our website, and the link is there at the bottom. Um, the report also provides, and that's what's shown here, some helpful vignettes on, um, on ways that federal investment in social science has yielded important outcomes for citizens, and these could double as talking points when talking to a policymaker or a staffer about the value of our work. We often get questions about what is the direct impact, what, what have we gotten from the investment in our research, and so here are just a handful of examples that you can use. But what else are we hoping to do? Well, we're very much uh, hoping to change the conversation in general about social science so that we're not always stuck playing defense. Uh, in this vein, we launched a new website and a new blog series last month called Why Social Science. And this is intended more as a public-facing series aiming to educate everyday people about the value of our sciences. Uh, the blog series will feature a diverse set of individuals, including government officials, researchers, industry folks, practitioners, etc., um, all answering the same question, why social science? And that is literally the only guidance that they're given. And what we hope to evoke um, are very different responses to that question, but all very rich in their own right. So I invite you to subscribe to this blog. It comes out um, every other Tuesday, and you can subscribe to receive it directly into your into your inboxes. We're also uh, we're always looking for uh, new contributors to the blog as well, and so would welcome welcome you all uh, to send us your ideas or to do it yourself. Please let me know. But you're probably wondering, that's a lot about what COSA does, but what can you do to help? Um, and I can go into a lot more detail on any of these, but I really do want to get us into the conversation. Here's a few ideas. Um, first, I would suggest that you get more involved with your professional societies if you belong to any. 
They may not have figured out yet just how they're going to respond as an organization to the new environment, but I can assure you that they're working to determine the best course of action for their members and for the discipline. And they could certainly use your support. If your um, professional associations do not engage in advocacy, if they have a strict policy on that, consider joining one that does. There's groups like, uh, groups like COSA, but there are others as well who have resources that you can use um, in your outreach, talking points and one-pagers and how to is shown on the screen is just our handbook, which is freely available on our website, um, with talking about the mechanics of how you engage with policymakers. Third, and this was implied, um, but you should engage with your elected officials directly. The calls to Capitol Hill in recent weeks have never been higher, and people who have never communicated with their representatives in Congress um, are doing it for the first time. This is really a sea change moment for folks feeling like they have to say something and be engaged in the policymaking process. Many may question um, whether one phone call or one email from a constituent can make a difference, um, but I'll tell you that no calls or emails from the social science community definitely will not make a difference. Um, and so sometimes it does work to be the squeaky wheel, and I think this is one of those times. Um, lastly, uh, consider participating in the March for Science or one of the satellite marches on April 22nd. Um, I'm sure you've been hearing about these and seeing them on social media. COSA is planning to participate. Um, we don't have a lot of details yet, but we will be inviting social science enthusiasts to join us in some capacity um, and providing some resources to help with that. And so consider coming, coming to town for that or um, uh, participating in the local march where you are. Um, finally, I'll end with a shameless plug for the COSA Science Policy Conference and Social Science Advocacy Day, um, which is happening in Washington March 29th and 30th. This is a two-day event that includes one day of programming and a second day on the Hill meeting with your elected officials. Um, this year's program will focus primarily on how to promote social science research in the Trump era. So how do we commu communicate better, understanding um, uh, the Trump electorate, um, how to engage with the media, how to get students organized, all of these sort of mechanics on how to do it. Um, and that first day will then inform the meetings that our advocates take on the Hill the next day. As for the Hill days, um, the Hill visits, we put people into groups and we send them off to their elected officials in the House and the Senate and we provide hands-on training, all of the materials you would need, um, and this really is the only Cross Social Science Advocacy Day in Washington, where all of the disciplines are represented and go um, together with a single message, and that is to help help social science. So I hope you'll consider joining us for that event. So now I'll pass it back to Michael, um, who will help moderate the discussion, and I I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. I'm gonna I'm gonna scare the the people by. Uh, pushing my camera on, and uh, maybe if you could do the same so people can see who's, who's actually talking to them. Um, no. In your case, you're, you're pleasing them and I'm scaring them, so it'll be a good <laughs> cop, bad cop. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a journalist by training, and so I, I tend to have a lot of bloviation before I actually get to my question, so, so humor me for just a moment. But Bill Proxmire was a Democrat, and he started some of the uh, attacks on uh, I would say attacks uh, on, on individual grants and calling them silly and things like that. And then there are people like Charlie Dent, who are a Republican, who have been helpful in, in issues like the, the Golden Goose, uh, which is something that's trying to protect social science and, and research funding in general. That said, a lot of the attacks seem to be coming from one particular party. And I'm, I'm wondering, is social science a partisan issue? And if so, why? And how did that happen, and how can we be partisan it? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think if you were, um, if you were someone in our community that was relatively new, and you saw what's been going on over the last several years, you would have no choice but to think that this was a strictly partisan issue. I actually have a graphic on here, if you can still see my slides. Um, 
<clears throat> here's a little little history lesson. Um, so here's a timeline from 1950 until 2010, basically from when NSF was created uh, up until the 2010 midterm elections. And what you see in red are sort of challenging times um, for social science, and then in black are more positive things that have happened. So the social science directorate at NSF was created. Um, the Office of, of Behavioral and Social Science Research was created at the National Institutes of Health. Very positive things that were happening. Um, but then every couple of years there would be something like um, Senator Proxmire's Golden Fleece Award. He was a Democrat. Um, but then the Reagan era sort of swept in these other attacks, as I said earlier. That's until 2010. If you look at what, what has happened since then, and now remember, 2010 was the Tea Party Revolution that brought in this new sweep um, into Washington, into the House in particular. And you don't see any um, very positive, um, very positive events for, for social science at all. Um, what you see are um, uh, uh, waste reports, so-called waste reports that are coming out that, that seem to or assert to identify waste, fraud, and abuse in the federal government. And, and a lot of times they, they suggest that certain projects in the social sciences are included. Um, you see legislation that seeks to target funding for social science and to cut it or eliminate it or to pick on individual disciplines. Um, I'm not saying that um, all Republicans or Tea Party Republicans uh, have, have these harsh feelings toward social and behavioral science, but what I'm saying is um, it's not personal to us. It's actually, um, it's about government waste. And uh, that was what the Tea Partiers came in and tried to change. And we happen to be, unfortunately, uh, uh, one of many casualties of that. So you have these folks and members of Congress who happen to be on the Republican side of the aisle who have campaigned on, I hate to use the terminology these days, but draining the swamp, um, and, and with a, a sort of a laser-like focus on budgets. We've had folks in offices tell us, we get what you're saying, we appreciate it, we see there's value, but my boss ran on cutting the budget and eliminating the deficit, and so we'll do whatever we have to do. That really is why they came to town. Um, and so I would say if you take the longer term view, you can see that it really isn't a partisan issue but we're sucked into this more negative, um, happens to be Republican uh, uh, issue right now, um, where we are the casualty of bigger actions. I'm afraid we haven't been able to see your slides, but I, I think we can still get those up. One of our, like just someone from the audience had uh, made a comment that I'll just, uh, in, in his opinion, Trump is a businessman. He's looking for R ROI on computing dollars. And, he, um, and again, it kind of deep depoliticizing this. He, he probably just doesn't want to see federal dollars being spent on politic, on what the questioner calls politically charged social science. So. There is some of that. Um, but again, as I said, we are flying under the radar in a lot of respects, we being science in general. I mean, of course, with the exceptions of EPA and a couple of others who um, really have a target on their back right now. Um, yes. Um, what scares me Right now are the folks, um, are, are all of the op-eds that are be, being written, the letters to the editor of, of scientific magazines that are talking about how much science is in trouble and how much this new administration is going to hurt us. Um, it, we're sort of showing our hand and um, while all of those things may be true, um, we're not on the hit list yet. And so we are sort of, you know, the duck floating in the pond where we're trying to stay calm and helpful and positive above the water, but underneath we're kicking around and we're getting organized. Um, and we're preparing and getting our spokespeople lined up and our talking points ready. Um, and we're meeting with Congress to jettison anything that may come down the pike later on. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more um, about in, in being ready for what comes down the pipe. What are some of the things that are in the transition document that, that you came up with? Could you give sure. us one or two specific things that we can hang our hat on? Yeah, the, the transition document is, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty common exercise that organizations often go, go through every four or eight years. Um, and it really is just a way for an organization to uh, come around a set of priorities and to really drill down on if you could only ask for a couple of things, what would it be? Um, and so it serves that purpose. Um, but it also serves the purpose of being an agenda for the next several years. Um, and 
and you want to write something that can be applied not only to the incoming president, because let's face it, he's probably not going to read it, um, but that you can use with multiple other offices. And so as a result, the document is written in a way that our, our priorities are things that can play out in the federal agencies or in the Congress. So for example, our, our lead recommendation is just sustainable funding for the scientific research enterprise writ large, but with an emphasis on recognizing the value that the social sciences bring to that, and that is where um, the examples come in of the value of our science. But other things include um, making sure, and this is kind of down the road already, but um, appointments, um, both cabinet appointments, but making sure that um, at sort of the staff level in federal agencies and in the White House, there are folks there who um, not only sort of come from the science community, but have an appreciation for the interdisciplinary um, nature of science and the value that our scientists play in making uh, evidence-based decisions. And that's really what sort of the talking point that we're using these days is there's going to be a lot of policy decisions made, um, but what we really want them is to be is informed and informed on good science. And I see a, that as a major role that social science can offer to an administration that um, may not necessarily know where to go for, for the right information. Speaking of, speaking of talking points, so one of the questions that came in from the audience is, how can we better frame our work as contributing to society, not, and um, um, she uses the scare quotes, waste? And that's why I have a question, I, I, I want, and I want to leverage that and talk a little bit about these waste books, too, that come out from various things. So, I mean, so there's two parts. How can we, well, let's, let's talk about the waste books first and, and, and what those represent, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about how we can change the narrative on that. Uh-huh, sure. Um, so waste books are not new. Um, these are, and I wish you could see my slides because the, the pictures of them are hilarious. Um, these are serious reports of, um, from, mostly from senators. They don't do them in the House as much. Um, but there are documents that um, list projects across the government that they see as wasteful in some capacity. So it may be um, a federal contractor and spending too much on this infrastructure project or, <clears throat> excuse me, um, or it could be a research grant. Um, and this was really a, a pet project of Senator Coburn from Oklahoma. There they are. These are, <laughs> these are legit um, Senate reports that have come out. Um, as a result, um, what, well, let me back up. First, what these represent are <clears throat> usually a handful of research projects, not always social science, but we're almost always in there, um, a mischaracterization. So I talked about sort of three threats earlier. There's funding, there's policy, and then there's just misrepresentation and misleading information about the value of our science. That's what these are. They're meant and they're designed, as you can see, to be um, publicly consumable. Um, they, some people in particu particular, like Senator Jeff Flake, who has the Pokemon or the Porkemon book there, and he also did the Star Wars one. He really tries, he, he puts one out every year, and he tries to make it um, uh, really of interest to the general public. Um, the problem here is, of course, it's a, it's a horrible um, mischaracterization of the research that they're doing. Um, they'll make fun of a, one part of a study, you know, think shrimp on a treadmill. They see that as that, the shrimp running on the treadmill and the YouTube video that came from that, millions of dollars was wasted to put that shrimp on the treadmill, which is really not what it is, and we all know that. These are models for bigger questions. Um, but nonetheless, these things go out there. When Senator Coburn retired a couple of years ago, there was this sort of clamoring in the Senate of who's going to be the new waste hawk in the Senate. And so we've seen this proliferation of reports over the last several years. And the ones that are shown on your screen have just come out in the last... 18 months or so. The good news is these reports often um, do not really impact policymaking, at least not yet. So they're annoying. Um, it's very inconvenient, and we do feel sort of this divide. Do we give them any credit by even responding to them, or do we just sort of lay low? Right now, they haven't been getting all that much attention, except maybe on Fox News for five minutes. Um, but you know, it is unhelpful, and it drives a narrative, again, with the public that we're trying to change with the public as well. Well, in talking about the, trying to change the narrative, this, the, the Mark, 
the March on Science, I, I assume, is you know, what that would be one of the goals. But we've had a couple questions that have come in that are a little bit worried about um, these. And let me, let me uh, quote from them specifically. Is there any risk to the March on Science? Could it put a, a target on science and, and, specific, and of course, uh, funding? And then uh, another person asked, does participating in the March for Science in and of, in and of itself politicize science? Right. <clears throat> um, I will tell you that I'm engaged in countless conversations every week since the election um, with the broader scientific community, including the AAAS um, and Chemical Society, Physical Society, everybody, really trying to get their head around this. Um, now that there's a date and we know that it's going to happen, that has changed our conversation significantly. Um, the initial concern with the march was how it was originally cast to uh, to the public. It was you know on a Facebook page. It had you know a raised fist as its as its logo. Um, it was all about Trump is anti-science and we need to combat that. <clears throat> that was not something that the scientific societies um, were going to rubber stamp in, in any way. Um, not to say that individual researchers shouldn't ask private citizens go ahead and march under those terms. But um, in the last couple of weeks, things have been moving incredibly quickly. Um, the organizers have, have changed entirely. There's a new logo, and if you go to their website, there's a new mission statement that's all about um, science for informed decision making and uh, uh, science as sort of an, the, the equalizer and, and very positive things that I think could be read like the mission statements for any of our organizations. So as a result, what we're seeing now, and of course this is happening in real time, having another meeting about it tomorrow with the other scientific societies, um, but uh, folks are, are bumping up against how they're going to respond now. Are they going to formally, um, they meaning scientific societies, are they going to formally endorse the event um, or simply provide resources to their members? Um, I can report that um, the COSA board decided yesterday that we are all in and COSA will be marching and we will have our banner there and we will encourage our members to do the same. Um, but to your to your question about risk and politicizing, there's a risk of everything, all those things happening of course, but um, my point to the broader, my colleagues in the broader scientific community has been the march is happening, we can't stop that. Um, but also Congress knows that the march is happening and so whether if we go up to the hill and we try to talk about social science, that office will have already made up their mind about what they think about the March on Science, and they will paint us with that brush no matter what. Um, and so I think, I'm arguing, the best thing that we can do uh, is to participate in the most positive way possible, try to control the message for our community at least, and make sure that our members know what this means and what productive ways they can engage in such an activity. And so, you know, I think at this point the benefits out outweigh the risks and also really when has there been this much attention on science there's been marches and other big events around climate change and individual science topics but this is science writ large and that's pretty huge for our community you might be muted Michael Try it one more time. Let me talk uh, a, a little bit about one of the applications of science, and that, that's evidence for policy. And one of our questions has, uh, how does the emphasis on evidence-based policy deliberations square with fake news mentality that suggests there are no facts, just interpretations, mm -hmm. often political? And in that regard, the Obama administration had the, um, I, I had to write it down because I, I didn't want to, I want to get the, um, the name correct, the Social and Behavioral Sciences team, the, the U.S. nudge unit, that was uh, embrace the idea of evidence-based policy, but so now square that um, with this fake news mentality. Yeah, that is, you know, one of these huge unknowns that has the community really rocked at this point. But a few things I can say. So first, I I think the the social and behavioral sciences team is is dead. I mean, the leader has left the White House. The the woman who this really was her brainchild, and she's led the effort over the last several years. Um, she's moved on, um, and I don't know. I don't even know if there are still folks now. The, these these folks were 
um, not working in the White House. They were embedded in other federal agencies. So there may be still some of this work going on, but in terms of sort of the presence that the SBST had um, as a White House entity and as sort of an Obama-led um, initiative, that branding's not going to be there anymore. Um, but there was something else that was happening around the same time, and that is um, the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking. So uh, Congress actually created a Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking a couple of years ago, or maybe even just a year and a half ago, bipartisan. This was from the Speaker of the House and then um, Democrats as well in the House and in the Senate passed this bipartisan bill that said, we need a commission to look at how to make uh, administrative data uh, that the federal government collects, how to make that more accessible, how to share data among the agencies, how to standardize things, and how to make sure that data is brought to bear to make sure um, to ensure that policies are are backed by evidence. That commission had, gosh, about a year to do its work, um, and it's supposed to deliver its report to the president of the United States by the fall. I think in the September time frame, um, and that those recommendations are supposed to um, suggest possible legislation <clears throat> that, the, that the president could send to Congress. A year ago, when all of this was happening, the social science community and the data and statistics community <clears throat> was really excited about it because it really did, um, we were sort of begging for policymakers to use our science as evidence for the longest time, and this was a, a, a formal mechanism for doing that. Now it's a complete black box in terms of um, what's going to happen with those recommendations. The commission's still working. Uh, they're still going to produce their report, but what happens when it lands on the president's desk? We have no idea. And underlying a lot of what we've talked about um, is the administrative data and the, the information that has been gathered by, by federal agencies. That, that's in general. I, I don't want to um, I'll be too Pollyannish about this, but in general, it's been considered the gold standard of of a good, solid, trustable uh, information. And you had uh, you alluded to the idea that there are some information sources that may be shut down, or that may be closed, or and there are some people that are hastily downloading a, a lot of the material that are on federal databases. But let me ask a, a specific question. Let me ask it, with, with that as the, the background, as the context. Um, a uh, questioner has, uh, what are your thoughts or advice on proposed legislation, uh, two federal bills, um, Senate Bill 103 and House Resolution 42, that would prohibit the use of federal funding to design, build, maintain, utilize, or provide access to federal databases, of geospatial information on community racial disparities. Um, yeah. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a, so it's not only are we talking about shutting down existing databases, maybe on climate science or something else, but now cutting down the, the ability to go out and gather this sorts of information in the future. So what, yeah. what, what are we to make of this? Um, what, should we really be worried? Are these bills going to go anywhere? Do we worry nonetheless? I, I mean, it, it brings up a whole raft of issues, and I'm wondering if you could pluck a, a few out and talk about them. Sure, sure. There's a lot there. So, um, And I think it's important to disaggregate between what the Congress is doing and what the administration is doing, because they're not in lockstep when it comes to um, when it comes to anything necessarily, but certainly not when it comes to data. Um, I think taking the administration first and what's happening with the use of data and evidence-based policy making and sort of shuttering at least public data coming out of federal agencies, who knows what's going to happen with that. I mean, what the only thing we can hope is that the career bureaucrats at the federal agencies um, are in a position to defend the work that they're doing and, and to keep, keep the ship right in those regards. When it comes to Congress, and I know exactly the bill that 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 the listener is is referring to, um, this is where things get a little tricky. That bill in particular has been around for a while. I think the language that he's that that's being referenced may be new language, but the intent of that bill is actually to shut down this sort of housing affirm, affirmative action program um, that was created a couple of years ago. Um, folks in our community, my colleagues, have been meeting with the sponsors of the House and the Senate bills uh, about this language with the very questions that you asked. Is, is this for real? Is this going to happen? Is, is, um, is this a serious threat? Um, the fact that it's legislation that's been introduced in previous Congresses does not always bode well. It could just be you know, a, a bill that, they're, that someone is introducing and getting co-sponsors for, but there probably isn't a clear path to passage. Um, 
that's one scenario. The other scenario, though, is that um, that the uh, sponsors of the legislation may feel emboldened by the fact that they now have a Republican um, in the White House, and so there could be an effort to sort of squeak through bills like this that otherwise, I think, in any other administration, truly, of any party, um, probably wouldn't have, have made it through, um, could be emboldened to, uh, to squeeze something through this time. I will say, though, that in the conversations my colleagues have had on the Hill about this specific bill, the intent to prohibit the collection of geospatial data in this way was not the intent. Um, and they, the staff now understand that. So there's uh, an effort among the scientific community to either get the bill changed or at least get a statement in writing or something that um, explains that the idea here is not to, um, to impact the collection of data uh, in this way. But it still, it, it leads to bigger questions about the motivations in these types of, with these types of bills and how they tie to the administration. Another question on the, the new administration. I, I think the answer to this is going to come from the known unknowns category, but I think, I think it's a good question that should be asked. Uh, what does the new administration think of, eva of the evaluation practice? And this comes from a, a member of the uh, American Evaluation Association, and I think, I think it's a good question. Even if I have a sneaking suspicion, we're not going to get a, a, a really solid answer. But yeah, I don't think I can satisfy you all with an answer to that question. It definitely is um, a large question mark, although, you know, I was in discussions with folks just in the last day or two who really do see this evaluation function as a way to appeal to the administration, but I think the risk here is with anything, given given the unpredictability of, of the president and the people he surrounds himself with, um, any effort to try to appeal could backfire in some way. I mean, I think our fear really is that we will become a favorite, or at least not attacked by the administration, but that our data will be used in ways that are not true to what we really think. It's sort of the misrepresentation of data. And so it's, it's a very difficult line, and I think evaluation is, is yet another one. Evaluation is very important, very valuable. I think the science is very rigorous, um, and under normal circumstances, we would shop that and, and sell that as um, sell that as something that that the president should use. I can't tell you if I feel confident that the president wouldn't use that for other purposes, and that worries me. You talked about using real data uh, in, in a way that may be hurt, hurtful to us. What about things that are a little less tangible, like people's moral or religious grounds that they use to attack certain levels of? or not certain levels, but, but certain types of, of uh, social and behavioral research. I mean, what uh, do you, A, do you believe that these sorts of um, ethics-based attacks are, are going to increase on, on social and behavioral research? And if so, what do we do about that? No, I don't think there's much evidence that that's really going to happen any more than it has in the past. As I said, we're, we're, not, we're not a target right now. Um, there are still folks in the Congress who take shots at us, um, but it's important to note that it's really like a handful of folks in the House and almost no one in the Senate who really have, who really take issue, not with social science in general, but with the fact that it's uh, a function of the federal government to fund it. Um, their arguments are more like, this is interesting, but it's not something that taxpayers should support. And so, yeah, occasionally you get those arguments based on sort of the more ethical or personal grounds. Um, but actually, the, the, as a result of the election, the margins have narrowed in the House and Senate. And that's always positive, no matter who holds the balance of power, because it, it, cre it forces negotiation, um, and it allows for more opportunities to shore up champions and support. So I don't think it'll be any worse off than we've seen um, in that regard in the last several years. And it, it occurs to me, I, I should probably apologize for making everything sound so confrontational. It's like, what are we going to do? I keep using all these military metaphors, and I, I apologize to you and to the audience for, for doing that, although it does seem like there, there might be grounds for some concern. Um, so for our, our pacifists uh, and our demilitarized um, uh, listeners, I'm, I'm wondering, how can academic societies engage with their um, their scholars to be more sensitive about some of these political changes? And I know you, you touched on that a little bit in your prepared remarks. But I'm just wondering, and it, and it kind of comes down to what can societies do to, to energize their people to just be vigilant 
And then two, what can what can I do? And I, I want to, because I'm not happy with just a single question, and especially for people outside the Beltway. Right. Yeah, that's that's really important. So I did talk about the sort of different aspects of our strategy, um, and I, the biggest concern that I've heard from uh, my members, and my members are not individuals, they're institutions or they're associations, um, is that as private citizens, we all are outraged, and we all want to take to the streets, and we all want to write, you know, go on social media and blast all the things that we find offensive, and that's our right to do that. Um, but associations and scientific societies are being asked to take similar positions, um, and that's really tough because science, first of all, is supposed to be nonpartisan, bipartisan, whatever you want to call it. Um, we need to appeal to all sides no matter what. And so, um, you know, my advice has been to societies, at least, is to find a way to articulate to your members that they should engage, they should do what they think um, they need to do as a private citizen, as a private scientist, um, but then rely on their society to do more of the sort of delicate work around navigating the parties and making sure that the statements that come out of the society on behalf of the discipline because they're representing the entire discipline um, and all of their members who hold very different political views, um, how to walk that line and be very delicate to the interests and the needs of both sides without, without um, endangering any very important relationships that are, that are being built. It's not, an easy, it's not an easy task at all. And you know, a good chunk of my board meeting yesterday was talking about um, what they can do. Um, but it's why I added the point in my prepared remarks about finding an organization that can actually advocate. I know a lot of um, uh, scientific societies can't because they're 501c3 charitable organizations and so they can only do so much. Um, but groups like mine, and there, and there are lots of others, this is not a shameless plug, um, but groups like ours can take that extra step and then it therefore gives your society some cover. So your society may not be able to put out an action alert, but you can point your members to, to ours, for example. Um, and it gives your members something to do and make them feel empowered. It's tough, though, because we have to manage the association business or the society business with the interests of the members. So there's, um, I, I don't think it's any secret that, that there are trends in, in what sorts of science and what sort of data are of interest to people. Uh, I mean, national security things are, are often there. And then we get really interested in health when there's something like a Zika or Ebola or something. I'm wondering if you're, if you're seeing any kinds of um, data or metrics that have been useful in appealing to the broader public, and especially maybe in, in districts where people are not necessarily as inclined to support social science. Right. So I'll actually flip that question a little bit, because um, we've been on the Hill a lot. Uh, me and my staff, uh, over the last couple of weeks, we had a couple of dozen meetings in a span of about 10 days um, in sort of our efforts to garner champions and to just get the pulse of what's happening on the Hill. And in our meetings, we've asked every single audience, every single office on both sides, Republican and Democratic offices, um, what are the big issues that's on their bosses' minds? Uh, and what would they be interested in having social science brought in to help in those, you know, address those issues or at least give them some clarity on what the data suggests. And in 24 or 25 meetings, there were really four or five topics that came to the top for, for policymakers across the political spectrum. Um, and some that I didn't expect. So the ones you would expect, um, I think, are cybersecurity, uh, huge interest, um, opioids across the board, um, uh, criminal justice reform was a big one. And one that surprised me because it was across the entire country was drinking water. Um, and so uh, another one was hazard response, sort of nat natural and human-made um, hazard response and communicating hazards and things like that. And so we asked that question because we're organizing a lot of our efforts this year, um, such as briefings on the Hill for staff and other types of events where we're going to bring scholars in to talk about certain topics, but we want them to be timely, and we want to tie them to the interests of the members who ultimately, hopefully, we're grooming to be champions for our issues. Um, and so I was surprised by some of those, um, but I think mostly I was surprised that across all of these offices, the same answers kept coming back. And so that's good, because I think it gives us, um, as advocates at least, 
some clear marching orders on what type of information to roll out um, and how, how to help these offices. And I think that's what advocates miss very often. Um, I feel like they, have, they, have, they feel like they have to be on send. I need this much for this program, and how dare you cut this? Um, and we've taken a different approach over the last several months in leading with what can we do and what interests you, knowing that the social sciences are so broad and have so much to offer um, that regardless of the topic, they could have pretty much said anything and we could find a way um, to, to connect social science to that. And I think this is really going to help because we've had significant follow-up from staffers you know, the next day or even the day of saying, that was very interesting, can you link me up with a scholar in this area or that area? So finding out what's of interest to the policymakers, the people who really are in a position to help you. So uh, kind of a kissing cousin of my, uh, I'm using so many military metaphors, is I've, I've kind of positioned everything as a threat. But, you know, a new administration brings new opportunities and new vistas. So tell me something or tell me many things if you've got them. Tell me something positive that we can look forward to in 2017 coming from uh, out of Washington, D.C. Right. Um, I don't know if I can give you anything positive out of the administration yet, um, other than to say support the career bureaucrats <laughs> um, because they're doing their best um, to make the, the best out of a tough situation. Um, what I would say, though, is the most positive thing that I suspect will come out of this year is a renewed um, appreciation of all of the sciences for each other. Um, the social sciences have been going it alone in terms of combating attacks for decades. Uh, not to say that other sciences haven't had challenges from, from time, you know, time, one time or another, but um, we've been dealing with it almost constantly since, you know, 1981 or probably before then. Um, now, though, because the last couple of years have been so challenging, sort of post-Tea Party revolution, um, all of the sciences have felt the heat. And so you have uh, other groups. You have AAAS. You have the, the university societies coming to COSA, actually, asking for help because they know that we've been dealing with this for such a long time. And so now, you know, I feel like decades ago we were struggling to get the national academies or the other scientific societies to really respect what we bring to the table. That doesn't appear to be an issue anymore. We are at the table having conversations um, with all of the other CEOs of all of these other scientific organizations as a complete equal. And I hope that's not a temporary thing, and I don't think it is. I think that really is a huge success story that's come out of the last several years that will be um, even greater this year, given that the needs are even greater. I'm actually quite pleased about that. It's interesting. We got a, a comment while you were talking about uh, be careful on the career government folks. Um, is it, I, I love this phrase. That's a self-licking ice cream cone. The more federal requirements they require, the, the more dollars they get. So, by the way, self-licking ice cream cone will be the name of my new band. But, yes. Um, no, no, I, I would agree with you there. Um, I will just say um, I have appreciated the, the contacts that we have in federal agencies who've been there a long time and who have done their service um, and the extent to which they're trying to fight for science in general and social science in particular from the inside. Um, and it's not an easy fight and it's just as easy to just sort of move out of government service. But there are, there are some people there who are doing it all for the right reasons. So one of the other hats, by the way, that was from a retired federal worker. Um, one, of the, one of the other hats I wear is for uh, SAGE's Method Space website. And so we're always, uh, we're, we're particularly interested, I should say, in big data at this point. And I'm just wondering, what do we think will be the status of big data initiatives? Because they're kind of cool and they're kind of sexy. And so that's good. Uh, but they may lead to some things that maybe run against policies that we want. So I mean, what, what do you see, what do you predict for uh, big data and, and government support in the next couple of years? Right, so I fully suspect that big data initiatives will continue as priorities within the agencies themselves. Um, federal agencies and departments have, be have been organizing themselves around those initiatives. They've been making um, major investments in those areas. And I don't see that stopping unless you know, there is some direct motivated um, uh, reason from the White House and from OMB to do so. 
Um, I just think that train is sort of out of the station. What I think is different, though, is the extent to which it has sort of the White House stamp of approval. Uh, so, you know, in sort of the unknown category, there are all these really big um, sort of previously White House-led initiatives, the Brain Initiative and Big Data is among them as well, the Cancer Moonshot. Uh, the, the former administration worked really hard to embed these initiatives, even though they had a lot of sort of visibility at the White House itself, embed them into the agency so that, you know, the train is already out of the station and there's buy-in from all of the parties and all of the stakeholders. I would I would suspect that big data is is in that realm. I, the bigger question is um, when it comes to White House talking points, will big data somehow become a dirty word because it's going to be tied into sort of the hacking questions and and things like that. That is complete speculation, but it's a risk that's out there. I have a very simple um, uh, question from someone, and it's a, it's an audience that we haven't really talked a whole lot about, although we kind of assume we have. I am a sociology student. How can I help? So, yeah. and, and what, where do we, what, first off, what do we tell students right now in the social sciences? Do we tell them, yeah, well, you know, career in nursing might be a, might be a better choice? Do we do, or do we say, no, no, stick to your guns and, and go forward. Uh, it gets better. I mean, what, what, a, what do we say to them, and b, what do we expect of them? Yeah, great question. Um, students nowadays, writ large have a tough go of it. Um, in current politics aside, it's hard especially to be um, sort of in the academic track, um, hoping to get an academic career. And so more power to you. I think that's fantastic. And I would not discourage you from abandoning ship. But um, I do think that students are where all of the energy is around this. Um, if you look at the marches and if you look at other sort of grassroots social media related um, topics on science and otherwise, it's, it's the young people. And um, that was a discussion with my associations yesterday is I think a lot of the um, angst about whether to engage in something like, like a march is, you know, it's because of the old school um, where there's this new energy and, and there, this, is, this is what folks want to do and so we need to embrace it. Um, I think for students in terms of tangible things, I think, um, you know, the things that you're already being invited to do, like marching, um, like blogging, um, but if you're not a student member of, of your association, sociology in this case, um, look into it because you can get really cheap rates to do that. There are other organizations um, and other disciplines who do a really, really good job of engaging their students. Anthropology is one very good example. They have, um, I think it's next week, um, World Anthropology Day where they engage with student clubs in they encourage student clubs to be formed, and then they engage with them. Um, and those student clubs uh, work in different ways to pro promote their, their discipline um, to students in the K-12 area and, and otherwise. And so we're modeling that, um, that type of activity with a session at our annual meeting to try to encourage the creation of more initiatives like this in the different disciplines and at universities in particular um, to help get students more involved. It's not a terribly satisfying answer, I understand, but I but know that there is a recognition that the focus on students is the right path forward, and and um, societies are really trying to get their head on what the, around what that means um, for their individual disciplines. So please do stay in and engage in whatever way you can. We're, we're just about out of time, so I just want to close with one um, what I hope is an uplifting question: Who are some of our champions? Our champions. Um, yeah, we have some great champions. Um, we're very fortunate. Um, uh, they're across the map. Um, uh, I can give you some names, uh, some specific names. Um, I would say the, the, in the House, the, uh, the folks who come to the top of my mind uh, are Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson from Texas. Um, she is the top Democrat on the science committee and so has gone toe to toe with the chairman of that committee who has been really the leader of most of the the most recent attacks on social science particularly at the National Science Foundation. Um, but there are some others as well on the science committee who um, without any prodding from us have taken upon themselves to combat against threats when those threats have happened. Um, there are there's lots of information on the COSA website of who our champions are um, instead of going down the list. I will, I will just mention on the Senate side, though, we have a much better 
um, chance of, of finding uh, uh, bipartisan champions. Um, and so on one of my earlier slides, I talked about how we're going to be honoring two senators as part of our annual conference at a reception on the Hill. One's a Democrat and one's a Republican. Um, and they worked very closely together on innovation legislation at the end of last year, which was, was a good bill, but it's, it's less about what was in the bill than what was not in the bill. This was a compromise with something that existed in the Senate that would have destroyed, truly destroyed, social science funding at the National Science Foundation. And these two senators, working in a bipartisan manner with the scientific community, um, got this compromise bill over the finish line that really saved us. And so we're honoring them, um, and the Senate is going to be an important backstop for our community in the years ahead. Um, the, the House still has um, the really extreme wings that are trying to push through some of these things like that, um, like that geospatial bill and some other things, but the backstop really is the Senate who is taking, I think in this case, a very important deliberative role when it comes to enacting legislation. They usually get a bad rap for being really slow and nothing they're ever getting out of the Senate, um, but in this regard I think it's going to help us a lot, especially because we don't have the White House to rely on now when it comes to pro-science um, positions. Well, thank you for, for this one. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I, I, we've actually gone past our time, which, which is a good thing, by the way, because I, I think that there was a, a ton of really good questions. Um, I want to thank you for joining us. I, I also want to say that um, uh, I'm, I'm going to read this so I don't get it this wrong. In the, in the coming weeks, please be on the lookout for an email. This is to our registered users. Uh, that will have a link to the entire webinar and to the slides. And uh, we'll also have some information on some of the things. So there was one question on the, the exact number of, of those uh, GIS bills, uh, you know, S, uh, Senate Bill 103 and the uh, House Resolution. We'll have that, and we'll try and have some other information. We will, of course, have links back to the Coastal website, <coughs> to the transition plan, et cetera. Uh, and then please stay connected with us on our, on our blog, Social Science Space, and on why Social Science going forward and uh, on both of, on all of our sites, COSA's site, My Social Science and Social Science Space, we'll have information on other webinars and other things that we really need to, to know about coming forward on these important issues. So thank you to the audience, thank you to Wendy, and thank you to my team. Good day. Thank you.